the cat. So we've started recording. Um, welcome everyone to um, to the this network session today um, on eating well from birth. And um, I just wanted to say a bit. Um, my name is Andrea Gibbons. I'm the um, UK network manager for um, Food for Life Get Togethers, and um, again, we're part of the Soil Association. And just to say a couple of quick words about the Food for Life Get Togethers is that we um, basically it's all about bringing people together um, around growing, cooking, and sharing food. And particularly for me, in terms of networks, it's about how we create connections with each other, um, both sort of how we improve how we're connecting to people locally and then how we're sort of bringing that together across the country. Um, and occasionally we get international drop-ins and that's really awesome as well. Um, and I think just in terms of, this is so important that, that about this connection, this idea of connection and coming together and bringing things together is, is really important. Um, not just because it's what we do, but, but I think it's really looking at how, how we build resilience, how we build support for each other. I think we're all sort of facing this, this cost of living crisis at the minute, and we are very aware of, of kind of the cost of that on, on ourselves, our families, our communities. And so it's really about how we sort of bring people together to sort of weather that storm, um, but also thinking about how we can have potential um, po positive changes looking to the future. Um, so, so for us and, and Food for Life Get Togethers, it's very much about bringing communities together in local areas, thinking about what we can do now, what we can do each of us today to bring people together. Um, we have an upcoming event called Plant and Share that starts on the 20th of, of, of April, and it's really celebrating spring and how we can use planting, seed swaps, um, growing, to sort of bring communities together. We've got um, like a, a little event um, campaign going on and there's um, lots of resources and stuff on our website, which I'll put um, into the chat. If you haven't seen it before, I don't know who we are. Um, there's also ways to sort of get on our mailing list and stuff. Um, that really is thinking about how we can work on a local level to, to come together and also to tackle some of these bigger issues that the Soil Association is very much involved in on a broader level, thinking about how kind of tackling um, food systems and climate change from the ground up. Um, so that includes communities, but also thinking about how farmers, foresters, um, all these other issues sort of in terms of how we access food and how this impacts on some of these broader things that we're facing. Um, and this is all about making the world better for our next generations to come. And so that's why it's really exciting to have a, a something like this that's really focused on the next generation and, and how, we're, how we're talking to them, how we're teaching them and how we're involving them in their own education around food. So I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca now. Okay, cool. Uh, hi everyone, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, oh, lovely. Um, and uh, here we go. I'm not very good at multitasking, so there we go. So um, uh, this is what the session's about um, and uh, my name is Rebecca and I'm from B Arts and we also uh, run a, a bakery and surplus food cafe called Bread in Common um, and we're based in Stoke-on-Trent uh, in North Staffordshire and we do we're, we, we're an arts company an arts and theatre company that's how we started um, but we do a whole range of community projects and we've actually always uh, involve food and eating together and cooking together in all our work. Uh, so I'm going to be in a little bit telling you in a bit of detail about one of our projects in particular, um, a little school, uh, but we've, um, uh, we do, we run a climate cafe monthly with our community partners. Uh, we do fair share with um, Stoke-on-Trent mums who are also going to be speaking on this call and introduce themselves in a little bit. Um, we have a regular chatty cafe group uh, once a week, which is about socialising and eating together and cooking together. Um, so that's just a little bit of, of who we are. Uh, and then I'm going to just let Laura uh, Carter just introduce uh, herself as well. Oh, you're on mute, Laura. I love technology. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm now off mute. Um, yeah, I'm Laura Carter. I don't know if you can all see me. Um, but yeah, I uh, founded So Content Mother Support Network in the start of lockdown. Um, and since then, we've partnered with BRTS, uh, I think since October 2020, it was the, the half term to um, we support mums and families in Stoke on Trent. And the partnership that we have with BRTS is with the Fair Share Project, where we provide food parcels, um, not just food parcels, so we give kind of 
basic instruction on how to cook how to cook the food that we give um you know we're reducing the food waste in Stoke-on-Trent and um instructions on how to store the food and things like that the other side of Stoke-on-Trent mums is we target social isolation as well through groups for low-income families so we've got the, the two sides where we're kind of really on the ground with the people that need it thanks lovely and we're going to be um so i'm going to tell you a little bit about one of our projects um and then we're going to do a q a with laura to find out a little bit more about her work and, and how she does it oh um there we go um so this is what's going to happen uh, and we're gonna we're gonna try and get it through it quite quickly because we also want lots of time to have some breakout rooms and for everyone to to talk together and discuss together who's on the call um so we're going to go through four different projects or activities that between SB Arts and Stoke-on-Trent Mums run. Um, and then we're hoping to cover in each of these, how we're engaging parents or children, depending on the project, um, how we're getting either children to take a lead or parents uh, and mums to, to, to help us shape and run the project. Um, what we've learned uh, when things have gone wrong a little bit, um, and then a little bit about partnerships and, and how we, we doing our best to keep some of these activities going. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go for uh, a QA and a and then into the breakout rooms. So that's the plan. Okay, so um, this is the project I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, uh, which is called Little School of Improbable Cooking. Um, and it's a um, holiday project for families and children. And the idea is it's as child led as possible. Uh, we started it in 2016. Um, and it grew out of, um, at, at that time, I had a one-year-old and a five-year-old, um, and I just finished being on maternity leave, and there were a few children's centres still open back in 2016 in Stoke-on-Trent, um, and I was uh, with a mum's group, actually, a parent's group attached to that children's centre, and um, a lot of the conversations that was coming up to holidays were around um, kind of worries around budgeting over the holidays, and uh, for in terms of childcare and in terms of uh, experiences as a family as well as as kind of the food element so in that um, which schools still do that when your your kids go back to school and they write about what they did over the holidays as, as kind of an so it it came out of these conversations with parents um, and kind of where I was in my life at the time as well and also we were doing a creative project in Stoke-on-Trent libraries at the time nothing to do with food uh, but um, at the time the libraries were had bowls of fruit out for example was something that they could do during the, the holidays and people would help themselves and, and we were doing an arts activity in there which was aimed at families and again we were we were talking to the families who, who were doing that about kind of what they'd be interested from a holiday project um, and then alongside this, lots of background, sorry, um, uh, child-led weaning had sort of come, come in as a, a thing for babies. When I had my eldest, it was all kind of baby food and mashed up food. And then um, I was in this parents group and um, uh, then the, all the health visitors were sort of encouraging, putting loads of finger foods out and, and, and getting, um, when you're, when you're uh, weaning to, to just a really different approach. And there wasn't much confidence um, and a lot of anxiety around how to do that. And also things like choking and and or and just worrying that the kids weren't going, the babies weren't going to get enough to eat because you're, you're not spooning it into them. You're sort of dependent on them doing it. So lots of different personal experiences came into it. And also this kind of working with communities sort of to to think about what they'd like. We did, did then do some structured focus groups. With a, with a few more parents to, to help us really shape the what's going to work as a, as a project. Um, and we spoke to the libraries and together they, they gave us a little bit of funding to run a pilot um, because they, they were really passionate about it being, um, it having a food element. And because we're in the libraries, it also has a story element, which you will see uh, as, I, as I talk about it a bit more. And that's because, um, uh, Stoke-on-Trent has quite low literacy levels and, and speech development levels, as well as uh, an issue with um, people having enough money for, for, for food, especially over holiday periods, where obviously it's a lot more expensive for families. 
uh, but um, I hope what's going to come through in, in the next bit is we really, our starting point was really how can we make it a positive, magical experience to really excite out with literacy, but we really, our starting point was around that experience. Okay, so um, I've tried to uh, so it's got all these different elements, which hopefully are um, in a way really quite simple. Um, so we start off with some kind of challenge or some kind of story to get people engaged. So things we've done is we've said uh, they arrive at the library and we say we've lost a dragon and we need, really need to make a dragon pie to tempt the dragon back. And we might do really simple things like putting dragon footprints out or we might make make ourselves look like we've got smoke on us because we've been attacked by a dragon uh, and then everything that we do then follows on from that initial that initial idea um so we've done our colors are going we're all in gray and we're sad because we're losing our colors so we need to make as colorful food as possible um and we've done lots of different things so we've done pirates and space and um uh, polar bears, so a, a white bear who needs lots of energy to get them through the cold winter. So we're going to make a food together. So then we invite the children to help us make that food. So that's like our hook. And I've listed some books there because um, we do we do sometimes use books, and those are just some examples uh, of some books that are about food that work quite well. Okay. So then the next step is we we do. A the treasure hunt for our ingredients, so really simple. So everything we've, we put in maybe a takeaway box or um, and we have maybe four things hidden around whatever space. This space is a community centre, but around the libraries, wherever we are. And then the first job is for the children to find our boxes and bring them to us. And then we open them up and we have a chat about what our ingredients are and we have a little explore of, of what they are um, and we taste them. This little girl here, she's tasting an edible petal. Uh, so we try and theme it with what our topic is, but um, or we try to choose unusual things or things that are in season. Um, uh, so, or, or yeah, get people interested that way. Uh, we dress up um, and again, there's um, it's just to get that experience, getting everybody feeling special and like they're, they're, they're um, it just makes it more memorable and, and that they're official chefs, that they're, they're kind of running the project. Uh, so you can buy paper forager hats, which are great because you can write on them. So we've got our chef names on these hats um, and then aprons and so on. And then we often will we'll go in a costume and we might bring some costume for the children to wear at the end. Uh, uh, and then um, in terms of what we cook, uh, so I'm going to give some ideas in a minute. Um, so, um, but we choose things that help you explore lots of different ingredients. So maybe things with a topping, like a pizza or a flan or a, a pie with lots of different fillings or, or a layered dessert. So things where you can use lots of different ingredients, or it might be something that you can use to make a picture or tell a story. Um, I, I practice everything with my own kids and uh, I maybe don't let myself use any equipment. So what can be done with bashing and ripping? And so how can we make sure that just breaking down the recipe uh, to, to make sure there's that it works and there's loads of different steps that the children can do um, and then often sometimes we're really lucky in the centre we're in has an oven and, a, and a cooking facilities but sometimes it's we're literally just in the library uh, so I've got some ideas on the next page so even if it's just filling a wrap with lots of different ingredients and, and exploring them okay so uh, these are some things that we've made um, and um, you'll see we use a little cupcake tray trays to put out lots of different small amounts of ingredients for people to try. Um, we were running it, we had about, uh, we used to run it with 30 uh, children and young people each session and then their parents um, and carers come to support. So we'd normally split them into two groups of 15 just so we're um, a different uh, person leading a session is working with a smaller group of people, but that makes it, um, I don't know if anyone's on, uh, that makes it a bit more cost effective to have lots of different ingredients in these small amounts for people to choose from. Um, so these are just some things uh, that we have made. Uh, 
Uh, and then just to give you a feel for, so pastry works really well. It's obviously quite tactile and you can, you, there's lots of different jobs that you can do that work really well for children. And then again, you can, you can fill it with lots of different things. Um, and these are some examples of them using loads of different ingredients, perhaps to make a picture or a design um, uh, related to our story. Uh, and we, we do find that they're much more willing to to have a go at, at least tasting uh, different ingredients because they want to include them in the picture and they want to be part of the the challenge and the the solution to the to getting the dragon back or whatever um sometimes we get them to make two one where they're really experimental and then one where they know they're definitely going to want to eat it um and then uh, we do also have we make sure we have lots of spare bits out because um i don't know if you're like me but i eat most of my vegetables when i'm cooking and if i'm chopping I'll, I'll i'll go through the carrots and so on so again just making sure that there's plenty of picky bits for them to eat uh, and you'll see just little things like how do you cut the veg to make it a bit more interesting so we've got peeled carrots we chopped everything a little bit differently so it's it just uh, makes it a bit easier to make a picture. Uh, this is the same kind of thing, but with a dessert. So again, we're using our trusty uh, baking trays to, to have lots of different choice for the young people. And um, uh, so this is meant to be a seaside scene with the fruit as coral, and we've just added dye, food dye to the yogurt, uh, and that's bashed up biscuits. Again, that's sort of been chosen to encourage them to try lots of different uh, types of fruit. And the different processes work well for children. Um, these are polar bear energy balls, an alien life form trifle, and um, a super soil dessert cup on this side with, with mint in it. Um, and then at the end, we finish the story. So the idea is always so, does the dragon arrive? We were trying to make dragon pie to catch the dragon, and then we have a dragon costume. Uh, or it's a sound effect or something else and the dragon arrives a bit like a Santa coming to eat the mince pies uh, comes uh, and we all sit and eat together and we've done it where we don't all eat together at the end but it works so much nicer when everyone does sit down and we, we serve them so it's again it's part of that special experience so uh, that's that's that project um We've sometimes we do a little bit of extras, so I've, I've just listed those, but I think um, just adding some of those simple things for us has worked in getting the young people excited and the families excited about taking part. Uh, so we do give people a little gift at the end, so that might be seeds to take away and grow, or we did a pirate one and everyone got a gold chocolate coin. Um, but again, just something to sort of wrap up that experience. And if what we're cooking means we have to wait for something to bake, then we might plan in to do um, kind of a song or a rhyme or a short craft activity that's on our theme to, to, to fill that time. And again, it's all about the experience. Um, so we've been doing this project in partnership with libraries um, and also with different community centres, with different community workers, with churches. And we do get booked by um, schools and nurseries to come in and work uh, with their groups. So our community uh, one has been grant funded in different ways and then the work with uh, often a school or um, uh, homeschooling work groups or even parties actually pay us to come and, and, and do the session. So it's a bit of a mix. Uh, and also we um, uh, kind of share uh, how we've been doing it. I know quite a few um, people come to the summer holiday uh, ones and then they take it back into their school or into their community setting and they redo some of the activities again and um, they come with their children and then they redo them. Uh, this is a really different project but not quite sure I've got time for it uh, so I'm just um, uh, I think this one is about um, working with parents specifically so it's timed after school drop-off um, and it's um, uh, it's kind of about sharing community recipes um, from uh, um, uh, from different communities. So um, uh, we've worked with um, Kurdish women who are sharing recipes, for example, uh, across their community that maybe some of them know and some of them don't know. And so we've mixed it in with a little bit of um, ESOL as well. That's how we've run it. But um, I'll just I'll leave that there and if anyone wants to pick that up in any of the uh, discussion rooms they will because I want to leave a little bit of time for our Q&A with Laura. That's it, that's it for me let me there we go. So
So I'm going to ask Laura questions. I think it's the plan. Uh, is that okay, Laura? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. Fab. So do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, how and why Stoke Mums started and what sort of things that you do? Yeah, so uh, Stoke Mums started kind of at the height of lockdown. Um, I'd just had a baby who she's got a million squillion eating uh, allergies. Um, and we were having a really difficult time where I was really isolated, you know, stuck in the house. We actually, I got the confidence to kind of take her out when she we got the vomiting under control the week that we went into lockdown. So we managed one, uh, one class, a baby sensory class where I took it and then we were in lockdown and there was absolutely nothing for us to do. So I started uh, Stoke Mums as a group of mums meeting in the park. We were socially distanced, it was all outdoors and we had council approval and we stuck to the COVID rules. But we were the, the I think one of the only groups that ran during lockdown, we had, um, two or three weekly sessions where we just used to sit in a park or walk around if it was raining um, and then from that we um, this was over a gin and tonic one night the Wednesday before the October half term when the government released the uh, the the message that they weren't going to fund the school vouchers for that half term and I, I, I was outraged I kind of said we need to do something so I planned this on the Wednesday and by Friday I was on the phone with Susan from Be Arts to say I've managed to raise 1500 quid in two days but I haven't got a clue what I'm doing and I've got no space to do it in. So that's when the partnership with Be Arts started. Um, uh, thank God, I don't know how I would have done it without. And yeah, we started to give food support to families, low income families in Stoke and some of the families that were accessing the groups as well. Um, that's continued to be a weekly thing uh, with the Fair Share project. So on a Thursday and a Thursday evening, there's a group of uh, members of the arts and volunteers who we go to supermarkets and we collect surplus food. So this is, you can see that in the middle picture, this is food that um, it's past its sell by date, but it's still in its use by date. So it's at the end of its life, but it, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and ordinarily it would end up in, in the waste and go into a landfill. So we collect all this food. The majority of it is, is fresh food and veg, uh, and bread, sorry, um, which we then divide between the amount of people who need support that week and everybody receives a box similar to the, the one in the middle, um, which it's wonderful to give people that, that amount of fresh food every single week. But what we started to notice was that um, a lot of the mums that we work with, they didn't know what to do with the food. Um, like you can see in, in this photo, there's a, there's a bag of, I think it's kale, curly kale. Um, and some mums had never heard of curly kale. They didn't know how to prepare it or what it was for. Um, so since then, so that, that was kind of a lesson learned for us. Um, since then, we've started to work with the chefs at Be Arts and we prepare a really, really simple um, recipe each week. And it, it's normally something that you can cook in bulk as well and that you can freeze um, so that you're not going to waste the food. It's not going to end up in the bin. And it's something that can feed a family for, a, a, you know, really cheaply because most of the stuff that we, we're putting in there is what we get in these parcels with maybe one or two bought ingredients. Um, so with that, we we very quickly learned that, you know, some some families, they don't like printed cards. You know, there's a, like Rebecca said before, there's there's literacy levels in, in Stoke-on-Trent and um, printing the recipes wasn't the way for us. Um, some families also didn't have access to basic equipment like a large pan or, you know, a chopping board, things like that. So that's something we, we've been able to recti rectify as well. Um, and most of the time we use our Facebook groups where we've got 8,200 members across our groups now and we recycle items. So if a family's in need, we put a post out saying this family needs pots and pans. Does anybody have any that they don't want anymore or they're going to get rid of and then we recycle so we're reducing waste and not buying new items by, by you know utilizing the networks that we've got so um I don't know if we can go to the next slide I think there's a an example of one of the posts on there so yeah this is these are the kind of posts that, that we put on um so the one on the left is just really showing that a parsnip that looks like the parsnip on the right is still usable when you peel it 
Um, I know that before doing this project, I would have looked at that parsnip and thought, oh my God, that's awful and thrown it away. But that went into my soup that week. Um, and then the, the, second, the second post is, it's how to use cheaper ingredients, you know, end of life food to feed my 11 year old son who lives on a beige diet. As much as I'm trying to get him to eat, eat fresh fruit and veg, he would love to just eat nuggets and hash browns for his entire life. So that's kind of encouraging families in Stoke to, you know, you're, you're still giving your children what they want, but adding extra bits in like the corn on the cob, which is a little bit exciting. And we actually got those on the fair share parcel that week. Um, and then the, the third photo was, it was a leek and potato soup we made with the fair share parcel using an oat, an oatly milk instead of um, a, like a, a cream, sorry. Um, so that it, it's all, it also caters to allergies and, and, you know, families who are vegan as well. So I try and make the option so that you can make it with dairy, but obviously because of my daughter's allergies, allergies we do it dairy free. I'm going to rush now, sorry. Um, as well as that, we've got the the messy lunches and the food based messy plate, which is they're, they're quite similar to the um, the little school sessions, but not as good, really not as good. Um, but they cater to much younger children. So we have the the mum and baby sessions where the mums come to the community centres, and we have the tough trays, which you saw the pictures in in the other the other slides. Um, and in that, what we do each week is we pair it with a story. So a really good one we did a couple of weeks ago was the hungry caterpillar because we managed to get loads of different foods in there. Um, one thing we noticed is that a lot of the children were coming to the sessions hungry. So every single session now we have a cereal, a, a cereal tray. And it's, it, was, it originally started as a, as a, as a texture tray. Um, you know, we'd have diggers in cornflakes and call it cornflake construction. But we realised that these children actually needed cereal. So they get the cereal tray. Um, and we also started a jam sandwich station, which it, it sounds really simple and it, it's so it's cheap to do. It's and the kids love it. But these children that come to the sessions hungry because, you know, the mums can't afford the food all the time. They get to just sit there and eat as many jam sandwiches as they want. Um, the other thing we've started doing is we have lots of salad and vegetables in trays for, for children just to sit in and kind of you know that the babies put the toes in lettuce and they get used to the textures and it's all it's all about familiarizing them with these different textures for food um, and like Rebecca said before a lot of the mums that access our services that you know they're coming up to weaning they they're not too sure about baby led weaning and the you know the size of foods that children could choke on and what they can and can't give them at this age so it's it's just kind of giving them the confidence with different foods that they probably wouldn't try at home um, but doing it in a really fun way so we have the hungry caterpillar story and we've got a, uh, a great volunteer who she does all voices she's brilliant she's also an actress with the arts as well so it, that's another another crossover um but yeah it's it is really just about getting the food to the families and giving them the skills and the confidence to know what to do with the food um, another lesson learned for us as well is that we utilise our social media a lot more with the recipes now because that's the mums they ask for Instagram posts or WhatsApp recipes because that's those are the kind of things that they use and um, they're not really interested in picking up a recipe book or cards so we try and do a fun post um, or a WhatsApp group text with space for them to kind of say I don't know how to chop a parsnip or you know, do I need to cook this, boil it first? Um, Instagram handle is SOT Moms. I'll add that in the chat in a second. Um, but yeah, so it's it's just a really fun way of getting food out into low income families who have low cooking skills and literacy levels. Thank you. Uh, that's great. I think you, um, I was just looking through the questions. I think you've answered most of them. So I've got maybe uh, one more that maybe was, uh, what advice would you give to anyone who wanted to start running similar sessions? Um, I would say, so there's, there's a lot of background admin that you need to have in place. Like you need to have your risk assessments and your, your public liability and also your um, communications with the centres and everything. But I'm more than happy if people wanted to get in contact with me and, um, you know, talk about that background admin of setting up the sessions I'm more than happy to do that um 
I, w- I would just say, just go in there with a really open mind and, and think about how you can make these sessions really, really fun for the kids, but not too daunting for the parents that are bringing them along as well. Um, and sometimes, you know, the sessions, they're not going to run the way that you want them to. We have sessions all the time where I think, oh, we're going to do this craft session as well. And it gets forgotten. Um, so, you know, if things don't work out the way you want, if people don't like the custard station, which they don't like cold custard, I've found out, then don't worry. You know, you can try something else at the next session. Um, that's great. And uh, we didn't share the picture, but if you do follow um, SOT Mums on Instagram or on Facebook, they shared a glorious picture after Pancake Week of absolutely everybody covered in flour. Oh. And um, just the tech, the kids must have, they look like they've had just the best time ever. Um, I'm banned and- from using flour at the at the. <laughs> It, it's not a, not an actual band but she said please no flour the lady that runs the center where where we go on a wednesday please no more flour and no more porridge um yeah it was everywhere and if you go onto my instagram the pictures you'll see and my uh, my daughter who's two and a half she covered herself in flour just completely covered <laughs> okay i don't know if anyone's got any questions for either of us um or yeah is that if we've got time for that, Andrea, is that okay? Um, then you can maybe pop them in the chat or put your hand up and if, to Zoom do that or give us a wave. Um, uh, the slides will be available afterwards and we haven't quite got it ready, but we are working on a little school recipe book, which has got some of the some of the recipes that we've done and some more pictures um, and um, also some of the things like the seed packets and so on in giveaways. Oh, we've got some questions coming in. Um, uh, it says, uh, uh, yeah, fact. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was funded initially by a grant from the National Lottery called Awards for All. Um, we got 10,000 for that, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and funds things like we've got a storage shed on my drive, which my husband hates. But, you know, it's somewhere to put all of the recycled items that we use. And it covers um, volunteer transport and travel costs and items that we need. Um, there's also... There's lots of small pots of money out there for if you set up as a, as a voluntary community group, which is really easy to do with a simple constitution, you can access things like the Arnold Clark Community Fund, which that's they do a thousand pounds in the spring and then the autumn. Um, so, you know, you, c- you can make your sessions really cost effective and two thousand pounds would stretch you a-, a long way. We do charge a very minimal cost for coming to the group. So we charge one pound seventy, um, which a pound of that goes for the room hire and refreshments and then 70p goes on materials but we run that on an honesty box system so if we've got the really low income families that can't afford that week um you know we don't make it a big barrier to stop them from coming um so yeah it's it's about finding those community funding grants that lots of unrestricted funding where you can basically run the projects however however you want to uh, so we've got a question from Amy, how do you promote your groups? Uh, and we've got a raised hand, which I don't know how to do. So um, Amy, how do you promote your groups? Is that to Laura? Both, okay, cool. Um, uh, so um, the, the library project, so we, um, uh, we do that through the libraries. So that's got the posters to go out in there. And as I say, a lot of at first, um, and we start in the library, even if we're not cooking in the library, and then we walk with the families and the young people uh, to wherever we're cooking. So we, we have a little mini parade that we do, or we meet them, we meet them there, and then we walk, we uh, book a community centre, or a, or we so quite often we get that on loan so people don't charge us a, a fee because they know it's happening or we're part of a, a summer a summer club um so um we work with the um yeah we work with sort of on at, at a neighborhood level different community groups we put posters out and flyers to schools before the holidays so they can target it at families who might most benefit um and we do also take uh, stuff to their local food banks in the neighborhoods where we'll be in walking distance uh, doing the activity so that's how we promote the little school um, we do loads of other outreach so we're in sort of in the community all the time doing youth club sessions and other sessions so and everybody talks about everything that we do so uh, that happens as well sort of more by word of mouth Laura do you want to say a little bit about how how you how- yeah yeah um so I think my um 
I want to say client base is it's a little bit different so I, I kind of I, I target the lower income moms of Stoke so my um advertising is all done via social media so I am in a million local community groups it gets really confusing and what I will do is every now and then I go and post out about the groups that we're doing we've also got our own um our own group called Stoke on Hemp Moms which has nearly 3,000 mums in it now um, and we started a new group at the start of the year called Women of Stoke which has got 5,300 women in it so it's we've got these online connections where we can we can promote our own groups and then we kind of go out to everybody else's groups to say that we've got these sessions running um, and yeah so initially I was I was having to advertise quite a lot like you know a couple of times a week but now it runs on word of mouth. So mums will tell mums about the groups and, you know, we've got regulars who come all the time and then they say, oh, I'm going to bring my friend. And yeah, we've got the website as well. We put everything on the website when I remember to update it. Um, but yeah, it's really just getting it out there on social media because we find that's the, that's the biggest thing that our mums will use. Lovely, that's great. And if, if anyone has a look at uh, Laura's social media, you do... Um uh you do really nice inviting people to post on different topics and so on so to keep it going and there's a lot of peer support happens on those groups which is they're really lovely supportive groups so there's uh, yeah, yeah just I recommend people have a look how she does it because it's brilliant yeah we do like recipe um what do we call it saute sundays we do recipes and to topery thursdays where we do gardening and you know just trying to get people talking about topics diy saturday mornings um you know, just to try and keep the conversations going. But yeah, lots of supportive posts as well. I think Jenny had a question. Uh, I don't know if you want to unmute and ask it, Jenny. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about um, um, literacy levels and not using menu cards, um, what do you do instead of that? Is it that you would like literally post online a video to show people or just to work with people in real time to show them what they should be doing it we or... do um sorry we do really simple photos so the the chef at the arts dan uh, what he will do is um so he, each week we prepare what we think they can make out of the out of the, the box and then i do it at home as well with my kind of just bog standard equipment um so dan will take a photo of peeling the potato and then dicing the potato, putting the potato in the water. So it, it seems like a very long winded process, but I think when you have those, those, those visual kind of images as well, mm -hmm. um, and then I will write out the, the recipe and the, the photos that Dan, that Dan does, they go to the mums that need them via WhatsApp. Um, so the mums that, that receive regular support. Um, so I, I, have a, I have a separate phone for the, the the charity side and that's you know it's got all the contacts and group chats set up already and yeah those photos go out and say this is what you can make this week and here's the step-by-step -step photos they don't all need that but I like to you know give everybody all of the pictures because then it also breaks down the barriers of that stigma of having to ask you know how do you chop a potato how long do you boil it for mm. what do you do with an egg if we already give it they don't have to ask so they can kind of, you know, there isn't that stigma there attached to it. So just to say, so Dan's the surplus food cafe chef. So what he does is he takes he takes photos of the surplus food he's preparing for the cafe as he's doing it. So that's that's um, that's kind of what's in place. So I know lots of people run surplus cafes. So I just thought I'd throw that mm -hmm. out there that 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 might be a helpful way that that he's done that, and that's great. Lovely. I think um, I think we're going to, uh, there was one more question in the chat, which was, what would you say your main barriers to participation have been? I think we've got literally one minute on that because we then want to move on to the breakout so everyone has a chance to, to talk to each other. So um, our main barriers to participation, uh, I don't know if that's to both. Uh, do you want to start, Laura? Or... Yeah, yeah. I, I would just say um, barriers to participation for me is it's stigma stigma attached to needing food help and needing help with how to cook things um you know the mums that I work with they've got a lot of pride and they they want to retain that level of pride um transport 
a lot of the mums that access our service, they don't drive, they don't have access to a car. So it's keeping things in the local community centres so that a lot of people, a lot more people can access the services. Um, uh, yeah, and, and assuming that one thing I learned recently is one of the mums that we've been working with for a long time has never had a cooker, which baffled me because she's been doing the recipes with electric uh, pans and hob things and an air fryer. So we, we bought her a cooker and we had some money from the council for white goods and we got her a cooker. So it's assuming, so not assuming that everybody's got the right equipment. So I just assumed that everybody had blenders and a lot of the mums didn't even know what a blender was for. Um, yeah, things like that. Yeah, I mean, we found that over the years as well. So things that people maybe only have microwaves and so on and adapting either for kind of what can you cook with that and what how can you do things in cups and spoons and, and all that malarkey as well um and and as laura says i people the big thing with little school is transport and people need it in their neighborhood um so so we do that project just in four neighborhoods actually but we try and do that really well in those neighborhoods um yeah right then we've got a poll haven't we and andrea for uh, 